All right, so the breathing-related sleep disorders. The hallmark of sleep-related breathing disorders is, of course, apnea, which is the cessation of nasal buccal airflow for greater than 10 seconds. So again, know the definition of apnea. It's cessation of nasal buccal airflow for greater than 10 seconds. Hypopnea is a 50% reduction in either nasal buccal airflow or the or thoracal abdominal movement during sleep, resulting in either a wake pattern on EEG or a 4% decrease in O2 saturation on pulse oximeter. So these are things that you'll want to kind of be familiar with. What is the difference between apnea versus hypopnea? Um, the apnea index is also important. It's a number of clinic. It's a is the number of clinically significant apneas per hour of sleep. And again, that would be something you'd assess during a sleep study. The hypopnea index, similar, is the number of clinically significant hypopneas per hour of sleep. The respiratory disturbance index, RDI, is the sum of all the apnea index and hypopnea index. It's the sum of all the apnea and hypopnea index. In apnea index greater than five or a Respiratory disturbance index greater than 10 is considered pathological and warrants investigation. So these are kind of the definitions that you want to be familiar with. Know what apnea is. Know that it's the number of cessations of nasal buccal airflow for greater than 10 seconds. And hypopnea and, of course, the apnea index, which is the clinically significant apneas per hour. The hypopnea index, the clinically significant hypopneas per hour. And the respiratory disturbance index, which is the sum of the apnea index and hypopnea index. If that's greater than five, if the apnea index is greater than five or the RDI greater than 10, consider this pathological and go on with further investigations. The first one we'll talk about is probably the most common and most um, well-known in clinical practice, obstructive sleep apnea. So the most common organic disorder of excessive daytime sleepiness, this accounts for 40 to 50% of all patients seen in sleep disorder clinics. So imagine half of the people you're gonna see in a sleep disorder clinic are gonna have obstructive sleep apnea. So keep that high on your differential. Especially if you see somebody, you know, who's obese with a big neck and lots of excess tissue, those are also kind of signs. The estimated prevalence is approximately one to two percent of the adult male population in the United States and increases to 8.5% of men between the ages of 40 and 65. So it's as men age, they tend to gain more weight and between 40 and 65, the, the estimated prevalence goes up. Women account for 12 to 35% of sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea patients, and a majority of them being, of course, postmenopausal. Nocturnal symptoms include snoring, choking, enuresis, reflux, cardiac dysrhythmias. Daytime symptoms include headaches, hypersomnolence, and neuropsychiatric abnormalities. The most significant risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea are, of course, male gender, age 40 to 65, obesity, smoking, alcohol, and poor physical health. So in general, the most significant risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea is of course being a male, being age 40 to 65, obesity, smoking, alcohol, and poor physical health. The things I'll point out here is obviously you can't change your gender. So if you're male, you're male. Uh, age, you're not gonna be able to necessarily change your age. Obesity though is controllable and that is something that you as or a patient has control over and that may be you know, useful for motivational interviewing techniques to try and elicit change in that patient to decrease their weight. Smoking, obviously also modifiable. Um, again, motivational interviewing would be a good technique to use for smoking cessation. Alcohol, again, modifiable. And poor physical health, again, modifiable. So there's a lot of modifiable factors there that you can target with motivational interviewing that may help you to change some of the behaviors in a particular patient, which may avoid them needing to use a CPAP every night. We'll see. Um, the principal deficit is occlusion of the upper airway at the level of the pharynx, the pharynx during so the wake sleep transition and sleep proper. So again, occlusion of upper airways at the level of the pharynx, and that's during the wake sleep transition or sleep proper. First line treatments are nasal continuous pressure airway, so nasal continuous airway pressure, CPAP, and bi-level bi posterior airway pressure, so BiPAP, CPAP, BiPAP. CPAP is probably more common um, choice, but those are first-line treatments for obstructive sleep apnea. So DSM-5 criteria, you want to have either one or two. Evidence of polysomnography of at least five obstructive apneas, so we said greater than five warrants investigation 
or hypopneas per hour of sleep and either of the following sleep symptoms. Nocturnal breathing disturbance, daytime sleepiness, fatigue, unrefreshing sleep, not explained by another sleep disorder or medical condition, to evidence of polysomnography of 15 or more obstructive apneas and or hypopneas per hour of sleep. So you want to see, obviously, to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, you know, proper, you're going to need to have a sleep study. Specify mild, moderate, severe, and again, this is based on the num the hypopnea index. Um, so mild apnea index or hypopnea index less than 15, so mild would be less than 15, moderate would be an apnea index or hypopnea index of 15 to 30, and severe would be apnea index or hypopnea index of greater than 30. So that's how you specify mild, moderate, severe, and that's the criteria for diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea as per DSM-5. Central sleep apnea is its counterpart, and this is condition of repetitive apneas in which there is a cessation of airflow without an attempt to initiate thoracal abdominal respiratory effort. So basically, the person is just not breathing, but not because they can't get the air in or the air is being obstructed from coming in, but because there's simply, there's no initiation of that process. There's you no know, complete cessation of airflow and no initiation of thoracal abdominal respiratory effort. The etiology of central sleep apnea is, of course, debated at this point, but felt to be related to abnormal CNS processes, so we think this is why we call it central, because it deals with the central nervous system. DSM-5 criteria are a evidence of five or more central apneas per hour. Again, sleep studies can help you diagnose this. Uh, or B, the disorder is not explained by another sleep disturbance. So that covers the so pretty much all of the um, apneas or obstructive breathing-related sleep disorders. In the next video, we'll tackle circadian rhythm disorders.